this time calls for two kinds of prophets. Some of the prophets will call us out, perhaps even tell us off. Look at what you're doing to the world, they might say. Gil Scott Heron was such a prophet. You will not be able to stay home, my brother. You will not be able to plug in, turn on, and drop out. You will not be able to lose yourself on SCAG or skip out for beer during commercials because the revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox in four parts with commercial interruptions. The revolution will not show you pictures of Nixon blowing a bugle and leading a charge by John Mitchell, General Abrams, and Spiro Agnew to eat hog maws confiscated from a Harlem sanctuary. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by the Schaefer Award Theater, and it will not star Natalie Wood and Steve McQueen or Bullwinkle and Julia. The revolution will not give your mouth sex appeal. The revolution will not get rid of the nubs. The revolution will not make you look five pounds thinner. <laughs> Because the revolution will not be televised, my sister. There will be no picture of you and Willie Mays pushing that shopping cart down the block on the dead run or trying to slide that color television into a stolen ambulance. NBC will not be able to predict the winner at 8.32 or report from 29 districts. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no pictures of cops shooting brothers in an instant replay. There will be no pictures of cops shooting a brother in an instant replay. There will be no pictures of Whitney Young being run out of Harlem on a rail with a brand new process. There will be no slow motion or still life of Roy Wilkins strolling through Watts in a red, black, and green liberation jumpsuit that he had been saving for just the right occasion. Green Acres, the Beverly Hillbillies, and Hooterville Junction will no longer be so damned relevant. And women will, not, will, women will not care if Dick finally gets down with Jane on Search for Tomorrow. Because black and brown people will be in the street looking for a brighter day. The revolution will not be televised. There will be no highlights on the 11 o'clock news and no pictures of hairy armed women liberationists and Jackie Onassis blowing her nose. The theme song will not be written by Jim Webb, Francis Scott Key, nor sung by Jen Glenn Campbell, Tom Jones, Johnny Cash, Engelbert Humperdinck, or The Rare Earth. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be right back after a message about a white tornado, white lightning, or white people. You will not have to worry about a germ in your bedroom, a tiger in your tank, or the giant in your toilet bowl. The revolution will not go better with Coke. The revolution will not fight the germs that cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The revolution will not be televised, not be televised, not be televised. The revolution will be live. This time calls for two kinds of prophets, the kinds that call us out, tell us off, point out our flaws. And then there's the Zechariah kind. Are you kidding me? Zechariah paints this pie and the sky picture as his people gag on the dust of the rubble left after the destruction of their city. Temple destroyed, Hebrew school demolished, no more corner market for pomegranates and olive oil. 
well clogged with the shards of brick choking on debris in the space that was once life-giving water. Their hopes are choking, their dreams are dashed, their faith is shattered like the walls of the temple. They're homeless, they're helpless, their best and brightest dragged off to Babylon into captivity. They are in exile. A delegation of leaders, a small group of people come back to talk to the wise ones, the prophet ones, about how they get an answer to make it all right again. How do we rebuild our city? How do we rebuild our temple? How do we, perhaps even more importantly, rebuild our relationship with the holy and our relationship with each other? They've been strangers in a strange land. They've got an exile mentality. Everything is urgent and pressed, but nothing feels satisfying. Without any tradition to hold them, without a container for their grief and pain, they've prayed, they've fasted, they've created rituals. God, will you, will you come back? Will you save us? Zechariah calls them to ethical living, but then paints this picture, this beautiful crazy picture of a world made right. Old folks like me, uh, hanging out in city streets, kicking it, chilling, playing mahjong and bit whist and drinking lemonade and perhaps even a run and coke, watching all the beautiful children play in the streets, in the playground. Um, you know, there, there is no pain, there is no worry, there is only joy. They're not worried about their health care being stripped from them. They're not wondering if they have to decide to pay their bills or buy their medications. Those old people aren't worried about their retirement funds being evaporated because of some greedy bankers. And the children? The children aren't wondering if they're going to get to go to college when they grow up. They're not imagining that there won't be a social security system for them when they get old. Oh no, it is a picture of utopia joy and laughter and peace. No strangers jumping out to mug a person because they're desperate and have no money. All of this, Zechariah says, is what the kingdom, the reign, the basileo of God is like. And I imagine the people listening saying, I don't even know if I can believe such a thing. I don't even know if I can imagine such a thing. There's no evidence that such a thing can manifest itself. Not when we've watched everything we know and love destroyed and brought down to nothingness. Do you have a hard time imagining a place and a time where children will play safely in the streets, where teenage boys won't be afraid of the folks paid to take care of them? Do you imagine a time, can you see a time when the fact that we've put a sexual predator in the White House and the fact that order after order disorders our nation, can you see past that to the Zechariah promise? My friend Yvette Flunder says that there can be no closet prophets. There can be no closet prophets. All of us are called to prophetic insight and dreaming. And what I want to say to you this morning, which is what I think Zechariah was saying back then, is that if we're going to get to the love revolution about which we dream, we need more than prayer. Oh my goodness, Jackie, you're a pastor. Isn't prayer going to get that thing done? Has it? <laughs> I think we need prayer and more than prayer. And the more than prayer that I think we need is one, a prophetic imagination that can see the world as it ought to be. If we are moving in the world without a vision of the world as it can be, I think we are lost. We're lost in space. Walter Brueggemann writes a book about exile and says that our, the call of our time is a call for a prophetic imagination that can see what God sees, that can help us find our place in God's 
dream. And for those of us who don't do the God thing, think about what love would do. Prophetic imagination requires us to see the end result, the tell us of what love can do. We can't always see. I think many of you know by now that I've lost my mom last Tuesday. And yesterday, I was going for a walk to clear air in this conference moment. And for just a moment, I thought, I'll give mom a quick call. Because that's what I do on walks. <clears throat> and then it reminded that she's not here for that call. I decided not to walk, and I decided instead to go get my nails did. <laughs> Thinking, well, that's kind of like a walk. <laughs> There'll be a little exercise in that. I sat down in the nail chair and got my toes did, too, because that's more exercise. And when, I got, <laughs> and when I got to the finger part, I looked at the young woman who was doing my nails, and she had a name tag on, and her name was Emma, which is mommy's name. Yeah. And so I thought, well, wow, that was a sign. That was a sign of the presence. Now, I didn't have to take that as a sign, but if I'm looking for a sign, that's a damn sign. <laughs> the love revolution to which we're called requires our prophetic imagination that can see the signs, recognize the signs, and then follow the signs to love. See little babies dancing. Imagine that the choreography was about them teaching them and then them teaching them, because that's what it takes. It's a sign. It's a sign that we're gathered here in this sanctuary, in our diversity, in our difference, in the way we name God, the way we think about God, the way we don't do God. But we're here because we know that there's a power called love, and it ain't wimpy, and it ain't nammy-pammy, and it's not wussy, and it's not sentimental, and it's not codependent. You can't hurry, love. Oh. No, this is a bold, powerful force, the only thing, to quote my friend, that we know can make a difference in times like these. It's only love that makes us stand up when innocent, sick people wearing their turbans, which means peace, are shot and killed after being told to go home. God, we need a prophetic imagination so we can look for the signs. Look for the signs that happen when a brother who loses his brother calls the man who killed his brother and says, God, I think I forgive you. That's a sign. When the millions of us marched all around the globe after we put vagina grabber in the White House to say we will stand up for the rights of women and these issues are intersection, intersectional, that's a sign. Zechariah describes this unbelievable utopia to his people who are in the midst of deadness choking on the very dust of the destruction of their lives. How do we say a thing like that in a time like that? How dare we say on a day like today that love will win? We say it because our very lives depend on it. We claim it because we have no choice but to make love, make love, Make love everywhere. Love that is empathic. Love that means when a child is hungry in Appalachia, my stomach growls. Love that means when a trans woman is forced to prostitute herself in a jail cell in order to live, I'm gagging, if you know what I'm saying. Love that means that when the white women and the black women and the Chinese women and the Latino women, when they're all standing around, I don't know, cooking some greens, they actually will have the power to heal the world because you know women will get it right. Love that means I am the queerest straight person I know. Forget ally, that's not enough. 
Love that means when your heart is broken, I'm crying your tears. Love that means we are inextricably connected one to another and across religion, across race, across gender and gender performance, we must stand up, hold hands, and be one love army. Do you want that kind of revolution? I say, do you want a revolution? <laughs> I don't know how to tell you. Hugs, kisses, I'm praying for you. Oh my God, thank you. But more healing than that is the look of you in this room and the work you're doing in the world. My mommy is proud of you. I am proud of you. And we need each other. We must do this work together so that one day our babies will be safe in the city streets. And one day, amen? And one day our older people will actually be cherished and valued. And one day every life will matter because black lives matter, really matter. And one day, and one day, queer people will never have to wonder if they're safe in city streets. Yes. And one day, women will make what men make for doing the same work. Yes. And one day, this land of the free and home of the brave will stand up to its promises. And we will be free. Yes. That's the revolution I'm talking about. Yes. Amen. Yes.